The best free games for Mac are CSGO, Dota 2, League of Legends, and Hearthstone. That's it. Those are the games. But you've probably heard that before, haven't you? That's why we wanted to try something different. So we took our shovels and dug deep to find more free Mac games that may be worth our time and yours. The newest games usually aren't the best games, as was the case in the past or even now in 2023. We left no stone unturned to find new games worth mentioning, but at the end we turned to those games that really had something to offer. So if that's what you're looking for, here are our recommendations. Where do I even begin with this one? Its team page tells you that this game is an MMO game set in space, and I guess that's technically true, but it totally fails to give you an idea about what EVE is truly about. Let's put it in another way. You're a spaceship commander whose brain is linked to their ship's computer, and you're free to make your own way through a vast galaxy that consists of about 8,000 star systems. The possibilities here are endless. Well, as long as you're focused on trade, exploration, research, combat, or if you'd like to spend most of your gameplay time repeatedly clicking on a rock, which is also known as mining. Here we are. You ready to rock? Get it? Rock? Just a sprinkle of mining humor for you. This is the PvE side of the game, and each of these activities lets you gain experience and in-game currency to upgrade your ship or get a better one so you can finally join the actual fun. Because you can labor away as a glorified FedEx courier, or a mindless mining drone, or you can join an interstellar organization and take part in massive space battles, where the levels of coordination and teamwork will give a real military commander a run for their money. Fire on the Apostle in five, four, three, two, one. Fire on the Apostle. Yes! Holy f***ing Very nice. Holy f***ing MWB's on. MWB's on. MWB's on. Start locking up the Minakawa. Switch your drones over to the middle. That's how it's f***ing done, folks. That's how it's f***ing done. I know which one I would prefer, even if I'm not very good at it. For me, the things that stand out the most about Evis, its universe, and the community that populates it. Everything on the game happens on a single server instance called Serenity, with only the Chinese player's base using a separate server, Tranquility. In plain English, this means that all logged in players are sharing the same in-game universe, so everything you do has the power to affect everybody else in the game's world. I mean, sure, if you're a nobody with a little more than a tin can for a spaceship, your actions won't matter a great deal. But there are players out there who can single-handedly fund a war or have a long-lasting impact on the entire EVE community. Of course, you're never going to be that player, but you can at least join their organization and work for them, kind of like in real life. Yeah? Anyway, EVE Online is a very fun sci-fi game to distract you from the depressing reality. So go have fun. Ah, you the new king. That I am, dude. Excellent. Here's an existential conundrum. What makes a good medieval king? Is it good financial decisions, sound military strategy, or being respected and revered by your subjects? Absolutely not. The right answer is to marry off your daughter to the sole male heir of a rich and powerful house and then inherit the lands and riches of that house after your son-in-law suffers a tragic accident. If that got your attention, then you've got to check out Crusader Kings 2. If you look it up on Steam, you'll learn that this is a 4x grand strategy game set in medieval ages, where you must micromanage every aspect of the state and dynasty. Economics, policies, trade, warfare, family relations, and more. The end goal is really up to you, as the game doesn't give you one. But putting it like this does a great disservice to Crusader Kings 2 by making it sound dull and boring. Don't get me wrong, you'll still be going through the equivalent of a spreadsheet encyclopedia, trying to figure out why your vassals are once again in an open rebellion, and why you're still broke after raising taxes for the fifth time this year. However, among all that drudgery, you will eventually uncover the true essence of Crusader Kings 2, which is all the crazy yet believable medieval antics that can take place in any given playthrough. From trying to ruin a rival dynasty's bloodline by marrying your deformed cretinous daughter to their only prince, to seducing a gay pope, thereby gaining the favor of the Catholic Church. The game offers endless possibilities where the only limit is the player's own depraved imagination. Fun times! 
came on her list reminds me a lot of my high school crush. On the outside, she was all cute and bubbly, but once I began to know her, I uncovered so many layers of crazy that Freud and Young would have a field day trying to figure out what was wrong with her. As for the game itself, it's called Doki Doki Literature Club, and it starts off as a cutesy anime dating sim. You play as a reclusive dude who's invited to join a literature club, where all the other four members are females. Kind of obvious where this is going. You get to date each of the four girls, and the gameplay mostly consists of clicking through dialogue and occasionally making choices that affect the narrative. But somewhere along the way, something happens, which changes the entire game. You're still playing a dating sim, but now you're also playing a psychological horror game. An unusual combination for sure, but Doki Doki Literature Club pulls it off brilliantly. We can't really tell you much else about the game and what happens without ruining the experience for you. But just so you know, the warning at the start of the game is there for a reason. I'm telling you, this is a disturbing game and it's not for the faint hearted. Now go have fun dating some cute anime girls. The next on the list, Unturned, aka what a threesome between LEGO, Daisy, and Minecraft looks like. The game's got several modes, but of course most people play survival. You're dropped at a random location on the map and you want to survive as long as possible against LEGO zombies. But that's not what the game is truly all about, because before you can even look at those beautiful pixels all around you, some other player's gonna blast you through the wall. And after about 70 dying attempts, I finally started getting why Unturned is so popular. I learned how to find weapons and tools, change my clothes, and keep in check my thirst, hunger, and infection levels, which can all screw you over by the way. And then one thought formed in my head. I am done getting dunked on by 12 year olds while running away from zombies. It's payback time. I got my base up, crafted some armor, got an assault rifle, and worked up my cardio. I was ready to go hunting. And I tell you, the game becomes infinitely more fun once you get to bully some naked scared randos who have no idea what's going on. Whoever made Unturned realized that everyone wants to stay in place to avoid damage, so to keep things interesting, they decided now you're gonna be hungry, so you can't regenerate health until you eat, or you're thirsty, poisoned, and so on. So all in all you have to move and face new dangers, or wait and slowly become handicapped. The game keeps a pretty good balance by giving you urgency by slowly tightening a leash around your neck every time you get lazy. But as I said, that's not what it's all about. It's about that time when I splashed some random guy's brains with a shotgun, and when I turned there was another guy standing in front of me. But he didn't shoot, we'd seen each other before. And then the most magical thing happened. We started killing some new guys together. To get a good idea of the next game, imagine your parents are getting you those new headphones you've always wanted. From Wish. Trying not to offend them, you do your best to hide your disappointment. You connect the headphones to your phone and play your favorite song. To your surprise, the headphones turn out to be quite decent, making you wonder if these cheap Chinese knockoffs might be better than the original. Stumble Guys is a lot like that. At a first glance, the game looks like a cheap attempt to piggyback on the success and fame of Fall Guys. And that's exactly what it is. It's a battle royale platformer where you and 31 other blokes control customizable ragdoll characters and race through all kinds of wacky obstacle courses until a single winner is declared. But like that guy in class who repeated your joke but louder and then everybody laughed, Stumble Guys blew up in popularity, placing it next to other legendary games of its caliber. Yet that would not be possible if Stumble Guys wasn't a solid title in its own right, which it is. The game took the true and tested Fall Guys formula of having quick, casual matches, short enough to play in your lunch break, and made them even shorter, so now you can even sneak one in while your boss isn't looking. The gameplay controls are as simple as they come. Aside from controlling where your character goes, your only other options are to jump and dash, and perfecting your timing with these two is the key to success. Just don't get misled by the game's cartoony graphics and goofy animations. It's a rat race out there and no one's gonna cut you any slack. So be prepared to claw your way to the finish line because in the end, there can be only one. So did you already try Stumble Guys and did you manage to score a victory? If you did, please tell us how. The time has come to put on the big boy pants, rev up the engine on your Tiger 1 tank, and put on Sabaton's Ghost Division on full blast. Because these next two games ask the philosophical question of how much mayhem, destruction, and explosions is too much. 
Let me give you a hint. It's a trick question. War Thunder and World of Tanks Blitz are both multiplayer action shooter games about war. But while in most other similar titles you're playing as a wretched foot soldier who's stuck in the mud, here you're given access to some of the world's deadliest killing machines. Tanks, military aircraft, and warships. As the name would suggest, World of Tanks Blitz focuses only on one of these three modes of destruction. You guess which one. In contrast, War Thunder lets you drive, fly, or sail into battle. Both games feature a stupidly large selection of military vehicles from different time periods, with War Thunder obviously offering the greater variety due to its inclusion of Navy and Aviation. Another thing that stands out from the latter is its painstaking levels of realism. War Thunder lacks anything close to a conventional damage system with hit points. Instead, the game sees each vehicle as a combination of modules, some of which are more vulnerable than others. Just like in real life, for instance, you get a good shot at the gas tank of a fighter jet and the whole thing quickly lights up the night sky as if it's New Year's Eve. Or you blow up the engine of a tank and it gets demoted to a glorified turret. You can expect similar levels of complexity and attention to details in all aspects of the game, down to the stuff such as the actual real life characteristics of each vehicle. On the flip side, though there's still a lot of depth in the world of tank splits, the game takes a more liberal approach towards realism. Hitting a vulnerable spot will deal extra damage, but you'll still need to drain the opponent's hit points bar to send their tank to the scrapyard. The two games also differ significantly in their game modes and matches. The modes in War Thunder are generally more realistic, and you don't see anything too wacky happening there. In World of Tanks, you do have modes that are semi-grounded in reality, but you also have stuff like this. Also, the most popular game modes in War Thunder pit two teams of 32 players against each other, whereas the teams in World of Tanks Blitz are much smaller. To put it simply, if World of Tanks Blitz is the counter-strike of military vehicle shooters, then War Thunder would be something from the Battlefield series. In conclusion, though these two titles may seem similar, they are ultimately very different games geared toward different types of players. Personally, I enjoyed World of Tanks more. The reason is I don't have the patience to learn the proper angle at which I must hit a T26 so that the shot won't glance off. And no, my skills at War Thunder have nothing to do with it. Other than that, both games are great if you're into shooters, military vehicles, and explosions. Now, you tell us which of these two you prefer, and what's your favorite military vehicle from that game? And so this concludes our overview. Did you already try any of the games? We'd love to hear your opinions in the comment section. Also, if you want to see more similar videos where we cover anything from the biggest AAA titles to little-known indie gems, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell. 